Excellent. Well, we're a small but select group this afternoon. Um, the problem with taking off your masks is that at my age, all your hearing aids come out, so you can't hear anything either, so it's actually hopeless. Um, I'm Alan Neal, welcome to this afternoon. Um, and we have four presentations um, because our colleague from India is unable to join us. Um, and so we're going to look at a number of the national responses to the challenges of the COVID. Um, in particular, you'll see that we have a couple of examples from what you might call Western Europe, we have an example from the socialist uh, regulatory regime from Russia, um, and we have an example from Turkey. So it's quite a nice mix across the European um, spectrum, uh, but not actually going beyond the European borders. I I'm counting Turkey and Russia as part of Europe in this, uh, in this context, at least from a geographical perspective, if nothing else. Um, and so what we're going to do is look at these. It's mainly panic stations, so the presentations are really about the reactions um, at the macro level um, to um, the challenges to labor market stability, job opportunity, and working away from home or in open areas. Um, and we'll see a number of common themes, but we'll also see, I think, a number of very sharp divergencies between them. So um, I've had the privilege of reading the papers in advance, and you will now have the privilege of the authors making their presentation. So let me, without any further ado, introduce you to Anna Ribeira, who is going to make the presentation. I'm going to move away so that she can use all the technology, um, because like Manfred, I claim not to be able to work out where the on switch is. Um, but uh, uh, we'll speak for about 12 minutes or so, um, we have a little bit more time. Uh, we have um, then some presentation of general points uh, from Carmen Agut, um, and she will do that uh, with the help of a translator. So we have a little bit of time needed for that. And hopefully at the end, there'll be some opportunity for people to make their observations, criticism, throw things, whatever they want to do. <laughs> okay, without any more ado then, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Neil. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here once again in Modena for, uh, for this conference in commemoration of Professor Marco Viaggi and to be among friends I hadn't seen uh, in a while. Uh, I would like to begin my intervention by greeting um, the other members of, of this panel, uh, our uh, moderator, our discussant, and also the public who is here to hear us. Uh, in my intervention, like Professor Neil said, I intend to give you a global view of the main measures that were that were implemented in Portugal during the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically, aim, specifically aimed at the labor market, and also a global view of the main features that the Portuguese labor market displayed during this period. I will also make some short references to the telework regime that was recently, um, uh, changes that were recently introduced to our legal system, as well as the formal enshrining of the employer's duty to refrain from contacting the employees during their rest periods. Well, and to begin with this, with this, uh, uh, with this overview, from March 2020 onwards, Several new measures were introduced, such as the temporary suspension of holidays and of the right to strike on essential sectors, mandatory telework. Well, actually, at first, telework could be unilaterally determined by one of the parties of the contract. Then it became mandatory. Then it could be, once again, unilaterally imposed. Then it was merely recommended. And then it became mandatory again, and then unilaterally imposed because the measures varied according to the uh, severity of the pandemic situation. Right now, it's not even recommended, although it is a possibility if both parties agree to it. Uh, and there was also the introduction of new rules for being absent from work. Uh, the prophylactic isolation of workers was equated to illness for the purpose of absence from work, and absences from work to accompany a child or a grandchild under prophylactic isolation, or to accompany children under the age of 12 years old whose school activities were suspended were also considered to be justified. There was also the introduction of new and easier conditions for the suspension of employment contracts based on economic circumstances. In Portugal, this is known, we actually use the, the English expression layoff, but uh, this might be a little misleading because uh, 
these, these employees are not being dismissed. Um, quite on the contrary, their contracts are being suspended um, precisely as a way to try and prevent their dismissal. Uh, this is um, during this time there was this easier and less burdensome uh, mechanism known as the simplified layoff, and it exempted employers from following the deadlines and the steps that are usually associated with the regular layoff. In addition, uh, the powers of the Portuguese Labour Authority uh, were reinforced, allowing it to block dismissals when they appeared to be illegal. Uh, this was a complete novelty in our system regarding not only the powers of this body, but also the way these situations are handled. Basically, when there is, ha when there is evidence of an illegal dismissal, the employment contract will be temporarily resuscitated by decision of a labour inspector pending, of course, the definitive court decision. However, if the employees following the inspector's decision fail to judicially challenge the dismissal in due time, then the suspension will be lifted and the dismissal shall become definitive. This is a very controversial, controversial measure that is still currently in place uh, and that, according to some, is unconstitutional because the decision regarding the admissibility or not of dismissals belongs to the courts. Uh, however, uh, others, albeit recognizing its unorthodox nature, uh, welcome this novelty considering that given the extreme times we were going through, uh, it afforded a much needed protection to employees without actually prevented, preventing employers from dismissing workers when truly justified. In the meantime, the, labor, the, the legal framework for collective labor relations was apparently immune or almost immune to the changes provoked by the pandemic. But in practice, collective bargaining was quite affected with a decrease in the number of new agreements which returned to the 2011 crisis levels. Furthermore, and for the first time uh, since this mechanism was introduced back in 2014, several collective agreements which were entered into by trade unions and aviation companies were suspended on the grounds of economic distress, leading to the implementation of several cuts to the salaries of flight personnel. On the one hand, of course, it is laudable that these suspensions were implemented through negotiation with the employees, rep with the employees representatives, because it made this a more democratic and participative process. But on the other hand, the union's bargaining power was rather diminished since, in the meanwhile, these companies had been declared as companies in economic distress, which basically allowed them to unilaterally suspend the collective agreements. So the unions were under a lot of pressure to acquiesce. Concerning now the main consequences for the Portuguese labor market, it should be noted that, well, the impact of the pandemic was, of course, duly noted. Uh, in March 2020, the unemployment rate increased 8.9% by comparison with the numbers displayed in the previous month. The service sector, in particular, of course, tourism, was the most effective, accounting for around 70 uh, 73% of these numbers. Since the beginning of the pandemic until the second semester of 2021, there, wa there was the destruction of around 172,000 jobs. Of these, 153,000 were fixed term contracts and around 33,000 were, were other forms of precarious jobs, namely bogus self-employment. From the second semester of 2020 onwards, uh, there was more job creation, but particularly uh, between the third trimesters of 2020 and 2021, 61% of those new contracts were precarious. Fixed term contracts, bogus self-employment, and so on. These numbers, these numbers show that not only precarious workers were the most affected by job destruction, but they were also the basis for job recovery, which is in line with the traditional segmentation of the Portuguese labor market. In the end, globally, the unemployment rates have varied less than expected. While in 2019, the unemployment rate was of 6.6%, it increased only to 7% in 2020, and it decreased in 2021 to 6.7%. Furthermore, uh, during this period, studies show that employees in general and female employees in particular 
suffered mentally from the pandemic. According to the Minister of Health, uh, the confinements, the economic insecurity, the demands of telework that characterized this period um, took a toll on the employees' mental health, with an increase of the numbers of burnout, depression, anxiety, and stress. While the extra pressure felt by women during this period was a reflection of the uh, household inequalities that are, that are still present in today's Portuguese society. As a Portuguese author stressed, the pandemic did not give way to new challenges in the domain of parenthood. Instead, it merely shone light to the traditional gender views uh, that are still anchored in the Portuguese sociological reality and that lead to a highly asymmetrical distribution of non-paid work between men and women. Another consequence of the pandemic was the need to revise the, re the legal regime of telework. Uh, in fact, despite the advantages that are usually associated with this figure, like environmental, uh, territorial cohesion, and so on, its presence in the Portuguese labor market was merely residual. Uh, this experience uh, revealed the need to review the telework's legal regime since it was found wanting in several issues, so, such as health and safety at work, the teleworkers' risk of isolation, accidents at work, Work and teleworkers' participation in collective relations, among other issues. For instance, regarding the issue of accidents at work, the Labor Code now expressly states that the legal regime concerning the reparation of accidents at work and occupational diseases is also applicable to telework. And the place of work for this effect shall be the one chosen by the employees to usually perform their activity. Another aspect that was expressly stated by the new regime is that the employer shall financially compensate the employees for all the additional expenses on which they may, they may incur with the acquisition or the use of the necessary equipment and IT systems, including increases in energy and network connection costs. Furthermore, the legal regulation of telework was expressly, exclu expressly included on the list of subjects from which collective bargaining may only deviate in malleus, that is, creating more favorable conditions. However, it should be noted that so far, telework has not been particularly present in collective bargaining. In fact, in 2020, the subject was present only in seven agreements. Although the pandemic provoked the contraction, of course, in the negotiation of new agreements, the truth is, social partners so far have not been focusing on this issue. And the truth is that it is still unclear whether telework will survive the post-pandemic test. Uh, but if it does, uh, social partners will need to pay greater attention to this mechanism, otherwise they lose risking, uh, they, they, they risk losing, it's the opposite. They, they risk losing uh, these, uh, these employees. But in order to do that, of course, the connection between these employees and collective action and collective representation will have to be fostered, which due to their greater isolation is more difficult. And this will be yet another challenge for trade unions who already face the need to modernize their discourse and their activities as a mean to uh, attract new, new categories of, of workers. Finally, the Portuguese legislator has also recently enshrined the employer's duty to refrain from contacting the employees during their rest period, an obligation that I should stress is not circumscribed to telework. The literature applauded the legislator's choice of words since they hesitated to talk about a right to disconnection. Uh, in fact, there is a right to rest and leisure. Therefore, disconnection more than a new right is a consequence of the aforementioned rights and emerges as a natural consequences of establishing boundaries to the, uh, the working time. The time to rest is therefore a period during which the employer should not disturb the employees. The latter should not have to exercise any right to disconnection, but rather the former, the employer, should abstain from, con from contacting the employees. This does not mean, however, of course, that this right should not have been regulated or guaranteed, particularly due to the challenges that we face today. But the emphasis should not be on the recognition of, new of a new right for the employees, but rather on the regulation of the employer's behavior. Um, this rule also safeguards the more complicated cases in which the employee has legitimately ignored an out-of-hours contact from the employer and consequently is subjected to a detrimental treatment from the employer. In this case, such conduct will be framed as, will be framed as discrimination. Nevertheless, contacts in case of force majeure are, are exempted and, and, and this exempt, exemption should be interpreted in a flexible manner uh, so as to encompass not 
only situations that are traditionally associated with this concept, like fires and earthquakes and floods and so on, but also other situations of unavoidable contact in order to prevent serious harm to the company or to its maintenance. And I'm almost finishing, almost, almost. Uh, finally, and in conclusion, <laughs> Uh, I believe that the Portuguese legislator was able to endure the, the initial clash with the, with the pandemic, applying or adapting already existing mechanisms and instruments to cushion the, the economic effects of the pandemic. Still, its negative effects on the Portuguese labor market are undeniable, as are its consequences. This backdrop shows us that it is necessary to go beyond what has been done so far and to more actively tackle the inequalities, to redistribute, to redistribute wealth and to create better and more stable jobs. Employee skills must also be developed, developed, providing them with higher adaptability to change. That is the only way that our recovery can be human-centered, I think. I realize that I have brought more questions than answers, but uh, I hope that this example will help us uh, reflect on these issues. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm all in favor of a presentation that raises more questions than gives answers. I think that's what we're all here for. Thank you for that excellent and very clear presentation. Um, highlighting in particular, of course, the different levels at which intervention is being taken. Um, the immediate panic response, top downwards from government, let's truncate individual rights, and then the challenge to collective bargaining, which I think is not being explored uh, as much as it needs to be, and we're starting to see that come through. And of course, the challenge to normative rights, uh, like, for example, in the European Union working time regulations, um, so the directive from 94, um, when it comes to holidays and these sorts of provisions. And that, of course, raises all sorts of questions about who is funding the actual consequences of those steps. So thank you very much for raising some fascinating questions. Thank you very much, Anna. Super. I'm going to need a, a hand, I think, to come out of that. So, somebody is doing magic there. Is that yours? <laughs> Marvellous. Okay. Well, Mariana Rousseau has uh, prepared this for you. Let me introduce her to you. Um, again, uh, looking at uh, a, a national response. Uh, but this time, I think we have to remember, go back two and a half years, the panic in Italy when this struck and the closing down of huge, especially in the north, it's uh, up in, um, uh, I, I think it's very difficult for any of us to understand what that was about. Um, and it's a panic reaction that triggers a lot of these. So you'll hear, I think, quite a lot about the, the sanitary side of things, if that's the expression. But uh, let me leave uh, Anne to make that presentation yourself. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing and scientific committee for the opportunity to participate in this international conference to share the results of my research findings and at the same time to receive your stimulating ideas to improve my work. Uh, well, uh, for me, it's the first face-to-face uh, -face, uh, conference after more than two years of uh, online meetings. So what a relief, what a pleasure to be here with you. I'm Mariana Russo. I'm a researcher in labor law at the University of Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli. And, and now I'm working on research on the transformation of the labor law with particular attention to the digitalization. But I've also worked for over 10 years as a labor inspector. And and this explains my particular interest in health and safety at work as attested by the title of my paper, Safer at Work, the role of shared anti-contagion protocols in Italy and beyond. Uh, protecting the psychophysical integrity of the worker is a topical issue, which can be separated from the continuous comparison with the progress and evolution of uh, health and safety techniques, as well as uh, with ever new forms of potential injuries to the worker person. Uh, for that reason, working conditions uh, are always in the spotlight and they are, they are constantly regulated by legislation, collective agreements and company policies. 
what has changed um, uh, 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 for uh, occupational health and safety during uh, the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, since the first month of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has put a strain on the production activities and the work organization all over the world as uh, symbolized in this uh, first slide. And uh, in this dramatic scenario, Italy was one of the first countries to face the, uh, uh, the health, economic and social emergency, uh, taking on the difficult role to precursor in the field of containment measures. Uh, you have to go to the second slide. Okay, I'll try with, with this. Okay, yes, in the second slide, uh, we can see a long, albeit incomplete, list of the regulatory interventions issued in Italy in the first six months of the COVID-19 pandemic. The high number of the regulatory provision is the clearest sign of the complexity to promptly define an organic framework for prevention and management of the COVID-19 risks. In consideration of both, the extraordinary nature of the event and the situation of uncertainty from a medical scientific point of view. In this challenging context, uh, uh, workplaces uh, played a crucial role. On the one hand, uh, keeping workplaces open, especially services considered essential, has a vital importance not to paralyze the country and its economy. But on the other hand, uh, it's fundamental to identify adequate measures uh, to prevent work from becoming a vehicle for contagion. And this balance uh, is very very hard. And um, sec third slide. Uh, technological problems, a lot of advantages, but uh, also many disadvantages. <laughs> I don't know. Why. I don't know why. <laughs> if, you, if you want imagine, I can go on. <laughs> Okay, now, now it works. Okay, what are the most effective uh, tools uh, to uh, make workplaces as safe as possible, even during the pandemic? Well, the traditional protection measures weren't enough to cope an insidious enemy such as the coronavirus. Uh, therefore, uh, Italian emergency legislation has issued a lot of specific action uh, to try to contain the spread of the contagion in the workplaces. For instance, the massive use of remote working or a lot of incentives, especially economic incentives, to buy personal protective equipment, technological devices, works to sanitize work environments. Moreover, the introduction of a mandatory vaccine for health workers and the necessary COVID-19 certificate for other workers. And last but not least, the anti-contagion protocols on which my paper is focused. Okay, what are the, uh, the anti-contagion protocols? They are uh, anti-COVID guidelines. They are uh, guidelines aimed at providing um, provisions uh, to increase the effectiveness in, in the workplaces of the measures by the legislative decree, introducing further measures to, um, to make uh, the workplaces as safe as possible, reducing the spread of the contagion, the spread of the outbreaks in the workplaces. They, in Italy, they are called shared because they are the result of a concerted action between government and social partners that are trade unions and entrepreneurs' association. 
the first general protocol for the private sector was issued uh, on the 14th March 2020, in the first days of the pandemic, under the pressure of the event. It contains 13 uh, operative indications uh, based on the principle of precautions, since at that time the, the medical scientific knowledge was very scarce and approximate. This first general protocol for the private sector uh, was uh, integrated a month later and updated uh, in April 2021. For the public sector, uh, the um, general protocol was signed on the 3rd April 2020. And uh, both uh, these uh, uh, anti-contagion protocol were joined by others uh, relating to the specific uh, sector of activities, especially the risk is one. For example, health services, transport, logistics, and also large companies have provided for their own specific anti-contagion protocols following in the footsteps of the general anti-contagion protocols. And in this way, the containment measures were more detailed and closer to the concrete needs of the production activity. And uh, these um, protocols are very important, not only because they identify the most effective and innovative measures to contain the spread of the contagion in the workplaces, but also because compliance with their rules circumscribes the space of the employer's responsibilities. Indeed, if employers uh, adopt and respect anti-contagion protocols, they are exempt from many civil and criminal liability. And conversely, no compliance with the rules of the anti-contagion protocols determines the sanction of the suspension of the activity uh, until the safety conditions are restored. And in addition, there are a lot of other uh, penalties, uh, civil and criminal penalties. Uh, well, um, the anti-contagion protocols aren't an exclusive prerogative of Italy, because during the pandemic, a lot of uh, similar protocols have been issued in uh, so many countries all around the world. Um, and uh, uh, it may, in this perspective, it may be interesting to have some comparative reliefs in order to identify the three most uh, relevant aspects that distinguish Italian anti-contagion protocol from uh, most of the other um, anti-COVID guidelines issued in European and uh, non-European country. Uh, first, uh, first of all, the involvement of all parties, uh, government and social partners. This is a very important, significant uh, element because the Italian anti-contagion protocols are the fruit of the social dialogue that is very challenging, but it's very useful. And uh, uh, for that reason, they are called shared. Uh, instead, um, a lot of other countries uh, have chosen another um, way, preferring a centralized form with the governmental issues. For example, uh, California uh, published a um, state's guideline, a very detailed state's guidelines, in order to ensure health and safety in the workplaces. And similarly, French government has uh, issued a general protocol named the in-company health protocol uh, to um, keep workplaces as safe as possible. The aim, the aim is the same, protecting the employees, but the use of tools is different. In Italy, uh, a shared form, in uh, other countries, a centralized form. Secondly, Italy chose to, um, uh, to start with a general discipline, then uh, detailed in a more specific way, depending on the sector of activity. 
uh, instead, in other country, uh, the path is the other way around. They decided to regulate uh, some sector of activities, especially the risk is one, and uh, without issuing um, a general and homogeneous discipline. For instance, Austria and Belgium laid down a specific protocol for the services considered essential in the most critical phase of the pandemic. Thirdly, as we have seen, uh, non-compliance with the rules of the anti-contagion protocols in Italy determines the sanction of the suspension of the activity. And it's a, a very a great deal for the employers. So uh, they have a mandatory nature established by the Italian emergency legislation. Uh, in a lot of other countries, the anti-COVID guidelines are all instruction advice to help the employers to ensure their health and safety in the workplaces in a so particular uh, situation and so they have a non-binding nature just think of the handbook uh, with instructions uh, given by Germany or um, or for example in a more general way the European Union guidelines or the WHO guidelines Okay, yes, I'm concluding. Uh, so, in, in the light of the above, we could say that the strengths of the Italian anti-contagion protocols are the involvement of all parties, the provision of a general uh, safety framework then detailed uh, based on the specific sector of activity and their mandatory nature. Another strong point is their timeliness since the first general protocol for the private sector was issued in the first days of the pandemic. So, so returning to the title of my paper, is work safer thanks to the shared anti-contagion pro anti -contagion protocols? It should be the case because the provisions are numerous and, uh, and they are constantly updated based on the monitoring of the virus trend and the development of the scientific data. Uh, moreover, the uh, involvement of all parties has uh, guaranteed the greatest awareness of employers and employees and uh, their active participation uh, to keep workplaces as safe as possible. Uh, however, uh, satisfying results depend on compliance with the rules. Uh, so, uh, in this perspective, the, the sanction of the suspension is a good incentive. Furthermore, the labor inspectors have been involved in the supervision system on compliance with the rules of the anti-contagion protocols, and this is another good incentive. So, what will the future of shared uh, protocols be? Is this a contingent phenomenon linked to to the pandemic, or have they inaugurated a new way of managing health and safety in the workplaces? Time will tell for sure, but uh, meanwhile, uh, we, um, there are some encouraging signs of a new spring of uh, uh, social dialogue in Italy, as attested by the involvement of Italian trade unions on, uh, in, on some important issues. And uh, uh, concluding, for safer work, uh, the adoption and the promotion of, uh, anti uh, and the, of the shared protocols may be the best way to proceed even beyond the pandemic. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Mariana, for that. Very clear and shows the benefit, of course, of putting this into the context of health and safety protection, which carries the criminal sanction. And that sanction is all about um, putting pressure to bear. Um, what's interesting is the way that's combined in the Italian context with the social partners being involved so that they, in a sense, share the ownership of the more draconian measures. Um, but again, I think we have to see that in the optic of a country which absolutely panicked at a time when there were no vaccines, when nobody knew what, what was actually going to happen. And I think you can see the consequences of that. So thank you very much for that. Excellent. Um, now then, um, Eleanor has made it all the way from St. Petersburg, which is great. Uh, <laughs> um, and she's not going to give you a, an electronic presentation. She's going to give it in her own words, um, looking at uh, the way in which, um, in particular, um, a regulatory system which emanates from the traditional socialist approach to uh, command um, 
regulation within the labour market uh, reacts to this. But I think there's probably more to say about that. And so I'll leave it to Eleanor to say that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's great pleasure. It's a great honour to be here. And recently, it's also an opportunity to have a kind of brush of fresh air. Uh, my topic is a little bit different from the one which is exposed in the program. I was supposed to speak about the regulations of COVID times in Russia, and I've also posed a question in the title, if there is any light in the end of tunnel. A small spoiler, nowadays no light in the end of tunnel. And still I will start with uh, COVID measures. Um, Russian labor law is quite particular, Ellen is right, because we have really deep roots in the Soviet labor law, and it is very little flexible, it is um, um, quite conservative. And actually, these were the very problematic points when COVID starts. So no one knew, no one knew what to do. Um, they decided to, do, to, to solve the problem of the suspension of all activities in their own very particular way. Uh, they decided to kind of ignore the experience of other countries, which already had formed by that time, and decided to declare non-working days. Non-working days meant that uh, everyone is going to be suspended from work and the employer is supposed to pay. So actually, they placed all the burden of the crisis upon the employees. And I think this is a very crucial point, because if we will speak about what is going on nowadays with the economic crisis due to some evident reasons, uh, the, the state is doing absolutely the same. So the employers are to pay for the crisis, but actually these are employees who are going to pay. Because as we know, the classics from Karl Marx, there is no such a crime, which is not the capitalists will not commit to have some profit. So basically, when we place all the burden upon the employers, it means that he will do anything to ignore this responsibility. And it happened indeed in 2020, because there were they, no one was dismissed. Oh, well, actually, the big enterprises did not dismiss, but what they did, they made the employees write the letters of resignations, to take unpaid leaves, to convince them to better register as unemployed. There was a 30% rise in the level of unemployed people, which was never uh, detected, never, never before. Um, uh, so these non-working days were the basis, uh, and actually was the start for the state to realize, well, actually, a lot of problems might be solved somehow if we will place the decision on the uh, shoulders of business. The second issue was a kind of mess in the sources of labor law. So there was a problem, and they were thinking, well, okay, if we are going to go through the normal legislative process, and in Russia, the key source of labor law is the labor code. So actually, they had to do it through the changes into labor code. Instead, there were just some presidential decrees. For example, non-working days is something inexistent in Russian labor law. And the president, if we will follow the legislation, it, he doesn't have the power to invent some new concept in labor law. It is up only to the, to the Russian parliament. No one cared. And all these degrees, they were very brief. And for the practitioner, it has been quite a quiz. What to do if you don't have regulation, but in the same time, there is a labor inspectorate which is requiring from you someone something. And labor scholars started to joke that now we have the new source of labor law. These are the interviews of the president's spokesman. And it was indeed the case. Because he was asked how we are going to lay off people during COVID. He said, well, I believe that you should not do that. The next day we had a special letter. Uh, it was uh, the kind of um, uh, interpretation by the um, uh, um, Ministry of Labor, which said, no, you cannot dismiss people during COVID. So this is quite a weird situation. Another point uh, of the reaction of Russia upon crisis is something good. Uh, it is the changes in the field of uh, decent work regulation. We had such problem uh, because uh, the new provisions came into force in 2013, so quite quite uh, away from, from COVID in 2020, but they were very particular. Because normally in Russia, it is almost impossible to dismiss an employee because there are um, the list of grounds which are fixed in the labor code. 
But the legislator was very generous for those who employ distant workers. They said, well, with distant workers, you can uh, fix any, any reason for the dismissal. Just put it in the contract and this is it. And distant work was even publicized by human resource managers as something very cool because it permits you to dismiss anyone wherever you want without any payments, without any benefits and so on. And we were writing with Nikita, me and other colleagues, we were writing about discrimination in the end of this group of people, which was definitely unfair. And only thanks to the pandemics, when almost all of us has become partly distant workers, the Duma has decided to think, well, hmm, perhaps those guys from the universities were right. <laughs> perhaps something should be changed. And finally, there was a new law adopted, which regulated differently uh, the distant work. And finally, they might be dismissed only on the common grounds for any other types of the workers. So this is something good, which should be also present in any presentation, right? And then, then I would like to speak about uh, long-term consequences. Here I would come back, would like to come back again to the desire of the authorities to place the burden on the employers. What do we see today? We see today that there is a very complex uh, economic situation and there is a kind of um, unsaid, or I better say unofficial, but very convincing uh, demand from the part of the state to big business not to dismiss anyone. What we see again, people are not dismissed, so they do not get an opportunity to have a new job, if any. They do not have an opportunity to get benefits, which are normal if you are uh, declared redundant, and so on. So they are kind of suspended or they are kind of forced to resignate and so on and so forth. So absolutely the, sa the same thing. And um, just a moment, sorry. Um, also, another point which is very interesting, that now uh, labor law has become much more public than it was before. So we were used to say that labor law is somewhere in the middle between private law and public law. And I see how it is shifting to mostly public sphere. And this is quite a sad thing because uh, the economy is not that public yet. So it just becomes very difficult to solve everyday problems with this machinery which we have now. And the last point, which is good and bad at the same time, it might be good for employees in the uh, short term perspective, but bad in the long term. Uh, the Supreme Court has um, has adopted quite recently, last year and this year, the new uh, kind of interpretation on um, interpretation of the norms on dismissals and on conclusions of contract. And there, very strangely, quite often, in contrast from, from what is said in the labor code, but it is very beneficial to the worker. So actually the state is now doing some messy steps, but in the same time is saying to the workers, you are okay. Don't think that you are in trouble. And this is really a kind of dangerous path because, as I said, in the short term it might be okay, but if we will see in the long term perspective, it's kind of no way out. So I don't see any light in the end of this tunnel, unfortunately. So here I would like to finish my presentation. Uh, thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, we can discuss afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. Very clear and very interesting, I think, to see the way in which the normally strong regulatory force from the centre has had to give way to pragmatism and then is starting to crawl back. And it's interesting to see it designated as a shift towards public law, um, which, of course, as a common lawyer, I know nothing about at all. So you should uh, un understand that comes as a great strange thing to me. Um, but it's also interesting to see, and I think there's, there are examples in many countries where what starts off as a restrictive or defensive measure on the part of the state actually can deliver some positive benefits especially for certain groups that were never regarded with great attention or favor in the labor market. So distance workers is a nice example of that. Um, and I think we can see quite a few countries where a certain degree of 
um, homogeneity has been given to the nature or the framework of the, of the protection, uh, and that even extends to my own country, believe it or not. Um, but again, it's dealt with through the Labour Code, not as a specific health and safety or sanitary matter, which of course would be very significant if you were analysing before 1989 as to where it came from, and it might be an indication of a degree of flexibility in terms of the regulatory process but of course the price as Eleanor clearly points out is that you don't know what that could lead to or what is actually opening the door to do so it's it's a very nice balanced um, double jeopardy I suppose would be the, the approach on that thank you very much for that um, we have one last um, Olgo is going to um, present to us um... hello can you hear me I'm, I'm, it's all happening. This is what you call remote working, you see. Um, and, and here we are, you see, we have working from home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Welcome to you, first of all. What's Thank the you. temperature where you are? Uh, I think it's around 31 degrees. Celsius. Uh, we're much warmer here. We're about 26 degrees. So, uh, <laughs> um, these are all the great things about Zoom meetings and, and connections online is you find all sorts of things. Um, when I when I ring anybody to find out the time of the trains, I discover the temperature in India or Pakistan or somewhere like that. So welcome to us. Um, we have your slideshow um, somewhere. <laughs> To be yeah, produced. I'm not quite sure how we're going to manage it, but the floor is yours in any event. So welcome. About 10, 12 minutes if you're happy with that. Okay. 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 Thank Tremendous. you. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, I need to use my own uh, desktop if it's possible, okay. because I need to make some changes in my presentation last minute. If you can run the technology, you are very welcome. I, 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 Brilliant. Okay, we're seeing the, the slides. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to greet the audience and uh, the chair and thank the Marco Biaggi Foundation, the organizing committee. I am very grateful and honored to be this part of this uh, international convention in commemoration of Professor Marco Biaggi. Uh, today, I'll be sharing the national policy response of Turkey. Uh, to COVID-19 and the main measures taken by the government are termination ban and unpaid leave, as you have already seen from the presentation headline. But before that, I need to explain some aspects of the labor protection in Turkey. So, first, uh, there are four major codes related to labor relations. These are labor code, the media labor code, the Maritime Labour Code and the Code of Obligation. These all have uh, articles regulating labour issues. And for the scope of protection, we need to look at the Labour Code, actually. And it says that the, those who are working according to the Labour Code or the Media Labour Code can only enjoy the protection of a secure job. And then uh, an employer has to be uh, working in a workplace consisting at least 30 or more employees. And this employee has also has to work for at least six months of period in the, with the same employer. Uh, and as you know, the indefinite or fixed term labor contracts end by itself. So they're also not uh, enjoying the protection of the termination security because there's no termination. And in the end, uh, not a uh, the employee doesn't it does have to be uh someone not a representative like a high-ranked representative in the uh, workplace uh someone who's regulating the labor relations like an employer himself so with this job security system uh the validity of reasons are important because these reasons either employee related or employer related reasons if present uh, the employer can terminate the labor contract with uh, giving a notice period uh, uh, with a notice period and as a result of this termination the employee also is entitled for the severance pay but if the employee related reasons are severe then the employer can terminate the contract with just cause and effective immediately and uh, after this uh, termination, the employee can 
of course, could bring an action against the employer, and this is called the invalidity of termination and reinstatement in the labor code. Actually, this is the exact name of the action. So this is actually not a action for nullity, for nullity of termination right. So uh, if the claim is accepted, the employee has to apply for the re to the re employer to reinstate himself, but the employee has the employer has the power to reject it and to pay the compensation for non reinstatement instead. So uh, this is a right of choice for the employer. After the COVID-19 outbreak, the Turkish government declared the closure of public and private workplaces according to the precautions proposed by the scientific committee. Uh, and some workplaces are physically closed and some uh, worked online or remotely as many other countries. And the first uh, precaution, uh, first law uh, is an amendment of certain laws. It's like a bag of rules. Uh, it is it can be shortened as law number 7226, so you can see on the screen. This is actually not an exact solution because it just had simplified the application process for the short time work allowance, which was already regulated in the labor code. And But there was an inter, uh, indirect termination ban in this code because uh, the code itself uh, said that if an employer wants to apply for the short time work practice in the workplace, he has to keep the employees employed during the process. So this is like an indirect ban. But however, uh, according to the reports of the unemployment fund statistics, uh, from the adoption of this law until the 17th of April, which is like less than a month, uh, this indirect ban wasn't useful enough because uh, there were half a million of uh, applications to the unemployment fund. It means that uh, more than half a million of contracts were terminated in this short time period. In order to prevent dismissals, it became necessary to take more drastic actions. So another law on 17th uh, April of 2020, the Turkish government adopted another law minimizing the impacts of the new coronavirus outbreak on economic and social life. And it's also uh, including another uh, articles uh, changing in many different laws. So this uh, law number 72244 had involved many provisional articles for labor code and social security court code and the duration of the effect uh, of these articles are for three months uh, although the president had the power to prolong this uh, implementation of these articles with a presidential presidential decree uh, and to be exact they have been prolonged seven times until july 2021 as we stated before there are four different codes so uh, it was a strange way of legislation, actually, because it was uh, in the labor code, this provisional article uh, in the labor code, but it, the scope of the uh, provisional article was affecting all of the employees and in all sectors and in all workplaces. And this was a ban and it, uh, it was a prohibition of termination. And it said that uh, an employer can only terminate a labor agreement with an immediate effect based on a serious misconduct or a just cause, according to the Article 25-2 of the Turkish Labor Code. Actually, uh, this is a this is a article, very long article. You can see online right now. I don't. I'm not going to explain each sentence, uh, but it, it can be shown like. This is for immoral, dishonorable, malicious conduct of the employee. And in the end, uh, this article was only applicable to the labor, uh, to the employees who are entitled to the labor code. It wasn't applicable for the ones for the maritime labor code or the media labor code. So it was actually uh, not a good way of lawmaking technique. And it was criticized in the doctrine uh, about this choice. And uh, after this impl uh, implementation of the termination ban, it is questioned that what the sanction for the prohibition period should be. There were many options in the literature. I'm not going to explain it all, but there are, uh, to be exact, there are five different uh, opinions. What should the uh, prohibited uh, termination uh, is going to be? 
Uh, but we can look at the case law a little bit in this time period. We had the chance to uh, find some uh, cases about this uh, issue. And we realized that some employers chose to terminate the contracts immediately without serious misconduct. In these cases, there were a variety of reasons, but these reasons were not related with the grounds provided by the article just I showed you before the article 25 slash 2. So the courts uh, consistently accepted the application of reinstatement while referring that these terminations are in the prohibited zone. And the same thing happened to the regular terminations with notice as well. Uh, neither employee-related nor employer-related reasons do not give any right to terminate the contract during this ban. In one case, particularly, the empl employer terminated during the prohibited period and relating to manpower surplus. When the court examined the documents, it's been understood that the surplus was already there in the workplace since 2017. So these type of reinstatement cases were resulted in favor of the employees. In one case that now you're seeing on the screen, that is interesting, the employee, employee filed a, a lawsuit regarding the invalidity of the termination. However, on that date, there were only 12 employees working in, at the workplace. For this reason, the court of first instance decided to dismiss the case. And the case uh, has been uh, in, the, in front of the regional court of justice and the regional court of justice assessed that this prohibition period uh, in this in this period, the termination should be considered as null and void. So the request of the employee who is not within the scope of job security should be considered as a request of determination of nullity. But after this uh, assessment, well, it went in front of the Court of Cassation, and the Court of Cassation decided that the employee filed a lawsuit with a clear request of reinstatement, and it is not apl apl uh, applicable to him. So uh, in the pr uh, procedural norms, it is uh, obvious that the commitment to the request, request of the plaintiff, uh, so the High Court rejected the case. Uh, because of the procedural norms. This is very interesting. And we should state that an, uh, other uh, cases have uh, also uh, were in the same, uh, in the, were going on the same uh, direction. The other interim measure is the unpaid leave. Of course, the unpaid leave itself is not something new, but in the COVID-19 period, uh, there, there is an exceptional regulation that the employer can coerce the unpaid leave and uh, give permission, uh, the government gave permission to the employers to coerce the unpaid leave and change the conditions all uh, by himself. In, of course, in non-COVID times, uh, there is a general protection against this kind of action, so employer cannot make a substantial alteration all by himself. So. Uh, if this case, if this happens in a normal time, uh, the employee can uh, effect, uh, terminate the contract effective immediately and earn his severance pay. But this was suspended during this time period. Of course, the idea behind it was to protect the legal relationship and also protect the employer from the severe economic result of thousands of employees asking for their severance payments. On one hand, uh, there is no option to provide a work because of the governmental decision or a protective measure, and the employment agreement is suspended and kept until the circumstances allow. And uh, on the other hand, employee is stuck in the suspended agreement without the consent, and he cannot get out, he cannot break from it. So the only way out is to resign, but if he doesn't know if he can find another work, he can be paid uh, during this uh, chaotic time so uh, when we look at the uh, when we look at the data actually we see that the uh, unemployment uh, rates haven't changed a lot during this time actually when we look at the economic results we understand we try to understand how the employees made money during this process of unpaid leave uh, during this period, the Turkish government paid a short-time work allowance until July 2021. But 
uh, there are not, uh, we cannot say that not all of the employees can benefit it from this uh, application actually, because if you want to apply to the short term work allowance, you need to be entitled uh, to the minimum uh, insurance premium, unemployment insurance premium of three years, and then you have to be working at least the last 120 days before the short work application. And there were already some employees who weren't entitled to this benefit. But uh, the amount paid actually is a really a large number, as you can see on the screen. For those who couldn't uh, apply to the short time work allowance, the Turkish government paid the financial aid during this time until July 2021 and for 39 Turkish liras per day. And the amount paid is around like 13 billion uh, Turkish liras for the last two years. Of course, the effects of the unpaid leave on the employee are not only financial. One of the questions raised in the doctrine is the effect of the duration to the employment relation and the calculation of seniority. COVID-19 related compulsory unpaid leave period should be considered as a part of the service period when you are calculating the annual leave and other seniority related issues. Uh, I think we will be able to see the assessment of the jurisprudence in the near future about this topic. Uh, I would like to assess two more cases about the unpaid leave before finishing my presentation. Both are on the crossroads of termination and unpaid leave. Then the first one that you can see on the screen, the employee was forced to unpaid leave, uh, but he claims that there is no other employee uh, in the workplace, which is a big hotel, uh, was forced uh, to the unpaid leave and the hotel kept on working at the same pace. During the so-called unpaid leave, the employee was re replaced by another employee. This was a reinstatement case, and the employee claims that the right to coerce the unpaid leave was abused by the employer this way, so it should be assessed as an unjust termination. The regional court, uh, actually this is the Antalya regional court in my city, uh, concluded that the employer's action was in fact uh, termination. This is an important assessment to understand the legal uh, act of the employer. And the next case is uh, a female worker had been working in a bank for 15 years. She was sent to mandatory leave because of her chronic illness. Actually, she is a vulnerable uh, employee uh, between the period of April and July 2020. When she returned to her workplace on 20 July, her computer screen wasn't working, so she couldn't log into the system to start her work. And this lasted for two more days in the bank branch. And the third day she went to when she went to the bank, uh, the security guards didn't let her in. And then she sent a warning letter. We are not republic about the situation and her willing to work. But this, after this warning, the employer sent a change of working conditions letter, which is uh, as of 1st July, uh, which is an earlier date, is very interesting. And according to the employer, the employee was absent already. So she was dismissed because of the this absent, uh, the, she wasn't uh, on the work and she was absent. So in this case, the court decided in favor of the reinstatement claims of the employer as well. Um, to conclude, it's important to state that the termination ban, the unpaid leave, the short time working and financial aid benefits implemented in Turkey were introduced to aim of protecting the employment. Of course, the disputes arose from the applications show only the negative side of the coin. Of course, a lot of businesses kept afloat, uh, thousands of labor contracts are saved with the precautions, but as labor lawyers, we need to evaluate for a human-centered recovery. Uh, as can be seen, the practice of termination ban did not prevent employers from terminating contracts. Some employers have portrayed these actions as a resignation of the employee, and while others have terminated the contract as if they had a, they had a just cause, although they had not, we anticipate that new decisions will be made for a while and we'll be uh, evaluating uh, the effect, effic effic efficiency of these interim measures in the near future too. I uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you.
Isn't it wonderful? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jolly good. You see, the trouble is, because I'm a judge and I do the cases by distance, the judge has control over everything. And if I want to stop you, I stop you. And if I want to listen to you, I listen to you. And if I want to speak, I speak. And it doesn't work that way. Thank you so much for that. You should have heard a round of applause, which was very loud. So thank you very much for that. Um, and again, we can see the state intervention role um, particularly in the two dimensions of limiting the scope of terminations, which then provokes, as you're suggesting, um, response, creative responses from employers to find a way around that. And the other, which of course is, is quite a well-known uh, phenomenon, the idea of state uh, underwritten continuing uh, operations. And I, in a moment, when the floor is open and we've heard from Carmen, I'm going to ask Manfred Weiss to say a couple of words about the German furlough system, which has been a, a, an inspiration, I think, for a number of countries in terms of job maintenance, even though the price may be very high later on down the line. And I think we're facing some of those problems. So thank you very much for illustrating uh, so many of those issues so clearly through the case law. And of course, the case law, we're all starting to discover what are the consequences of these interventions. So before we look at that, um, I'm going to invite Carmen Agut Karam. Uh, okay, Carmen's going to do it through through translation. So here we go. Um, th this is. This is a multilingual approach um, to drawing some conclusions together. So uh, I'm going to leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Olga, for your translation skills, interpretation skills, and I shall send you that. Carmen, all yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I, I apologize because my English is not uh, enough good to, to do this work. Then I have the help of Olga. She translates this, this intervention. My, my italiano is not very is not buono too, pero speriamo che facciamo. Ok. Eh, niente, innanzitutto eh, vorrei ringraziare il fatto di essere in questo posto, in questa fondazione. Eh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Marco Biagi Foundation for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Sì, eh, per il fatto di fare questo piccolo ricordo a Marco Biagi. And I'm also very happy to um, uh, record Marco Biagi here. Sì, eh, io ho conosciuto Marco Biagi nell'anno eh, 1996. Sono... I uh, had the chance to know personally Marco Biagi in uh, 1997, 96. 96, yeah. Eh, sono venuta con una borsa di studio e da quel momento in poi veramente diciamo, il, il lavoro e anche la persona di Marco è stato proprio colpente per me. I went uh, here for the first time with the scholarship and then uh, it was, uh, uh, scusa cosa hai detto? È molto colpente, mi sono uh, And it, it influenced a lot uh, all my career then. Eh, niente, eh, sono sicura che Marco sarebbe molto contento con un convegno di questo genere. I, I'm sure that Marco would be very, very happy uh, with a conference like this. Sì, così, con tanta gente giovane. With giovani, so many young people. Yeah, così, di tanti paesi. From a lot of uh, different countries. Sì, e con questo tipo di lavoro comparato. Di, uh, uh, with this comparative uh, studies. Ok. E now, niente, eh, vado avanti con questo piccolo riassunto di quale abbiamo visto. Now I'm going to provide a short uh, resume of what uh, was said during the, um, uh, this session. Ok, eh, vabbè, credo che quello che abbiamo visto qui è alla fine un po' un piccolo esempio di come è andata la situazione col Covid in tutto il mondo, in tutti so, i paesi. So we can see uh, the, um, the experience of various countries, how they reacted on the Covid pandemics uh, all over the world. Sì. La pandemia ha colpito tutti così improvviso. So the pandemic was a sudden and unexpected thing for everybody, of course. Sì. Poi eh, i rapporti di lavoro e tutto quanto riguarda il mondo del lavoro ha dovuto mettersi eh, in fretta. And of course it was, a, it was a stress for labor law and uh, social security and industrial relations. Anche tutti, credo, tutte le branche del, del diritto di lavoro. All, diritto. all the branches of uh, law were affected by Covid pandemic. Ok, il diritto sostantivo, il diritto alla, della procedura. Anche... Uh, procedural law, substantial law, eccetera. Ok, 
E questo è messo anche sul tavolo, eh, diciamo, le norme dell'emergenza eh, sono norme che, come abbiamo visto, credo è accaduto da, da tutti, eh, che mh, ci danno problemi di tecnica legislativa nell'inizio. Uh, so, every, uh, each country applied a set of uh, norms, uh, which of course uh, provided uh, different applicational uh, problems e anche problemi nel modo in cui vengono, vengono emerge, de, diciamo come vengono adottate le norme, in modo in cui si fanno anche. Also the problem of uh, the adapt, uh, adopting of the norms. Mm -hmm. eh, eh, per esempio, non sono diciamo in questa messa, però per esempio in Spagna la norma eh, che ha fatto possibili tutte le altre norme, poi eh, è detto per il Tribunale Costituzionale che non si poteva fare. Per esempio, in Spagna hanno adottato una norma che ha provato una legale base per tutte le norme successive, ma poi è stata abrogata dal Costituzionale Corte. Sì, ok. E allora, abbiamo anche questo problema, prima, nel, diciamo, in come le norme si sono fatte. E so, poi... abbiamo il primo problema, come le norme sono fatte. Okay. Formed, um, sì. And then, obviously, then the pro uh, il problema di come queste norme vengono applicate. And then uh, the problem of applica applicability of these norms. Okay. Sì. Ta anche il problema se si se applicano bene, voglio dire che non, non sempre è facile. Eh, also the problem if they are well, uh, well applicated in practice. Sì. Uh, L'interpretazione alla fine di queste norme. Sì. And then the interpretation of these norms ma anche se qualcuno non vuole applicare quelle norme proprio perché vuole andare, diciamo, and dietro problem, di... E il problema è anche la evitazione possibile di queste norme. Mm -hmm. okay. eh, diciamo che quello che c'è anche sul tavolo è che eh, ogni paese ha un punto di partenza nelle sue norme. So il problema è che ogni paese ha il suo starting point, un reference point per tutte le norme. Norme che possono essere più, più o meno simili. Anche se le norme sono molto simili, a prima glance. Nell'istituzione va proprio ovviamente ogni società ha il suo modo di fare, ha, diciamo la sua Each country, of course, applies them in a different manner, uh, mm -hmm. according to its proper institutional system. Sì, dico questo perché abbiamo visto che ci sono delle misure eh, che si prendono più o meno in tutti i paesi. So we saw the measures which were taken in almost all the countries. Però eh, il modo in cui dopo questo eh, funziona sicuramente non è uguale. È But molto of course diverso. these norms in practice function very differently in all these countries. Eh, non so, per esempio, no? è, è chiaro che il lavoro a distanza... For eh, example, we take a distance walk. Sì, di cui il telelavoro è un modo. Uh, for example, uh, teleworking. Sì, eh, sembra che l'abbiamo preso praticamente tutti, no? Nel primo momento. Uh, at the first moment, every country implemented teleworking or remote working. Sì. Però il modo in cui dopo i diritti dei lavoratori, anche gli obblighi del datore di lavoro, viene messo. E, e And of course, then uh, the involvement of uh, employees' rights and employers' obligations uh, was very different in all uh -huh. these countries. And it's different during, uh, durante la pandemia e sicuramente anche dopo, perché... Uh, also uh, during the pandemics, but also after the pandemics. Mm -hmm. Eh, per esempio, un'altra istituzione che sembra eh, molto... For usata. example, another institute of labor law is... Um, is la sospensione del contratto di lavoro. Is suspension of the labor contract. Mm -hmm. eh, sospensione che di solito viene con una prestazione sociale per, diciamo, eh, mettere a posto questo, no, questo di non guadagnare soldi. And of course there is a social assistance, state assistance in this case. Sì, però anche questo è diverso perché abbiamo But, visto... Dalla But Russia also viene the application is very different, practical application is very sì. different in all the countries, like for example in the case of Russia. Sì, è il datore di lavoro che nell'inizio assume questo costo. So they, uh, normally the employer at the beginning had to assume this cost. E altri paesi in cui questo viene dato dalla sicurezza sociale. For example, in other countries, for example, they gave, uh, received the support from social security system. A, a paesi dove questo che si chiede alla sicurezza sociale viene anche questo dal datore dal lavoro. Uh, also this is paid then by the employers. Più semplice per il lavoratore, invece altri fanno che sia il lavoratore che anche deve prendere cura di questo. In other countries uh, the main burden was put on the shoulders of the employees. 
eh, un'altra istituzione è quella di puntare sul eh, tempo di lavoro. Another institution is uh, working time. Ok. Eh, che anche in ogni paese sembra che non è andato del mismo modo. And uh, sia... also in this case we have very different reaction from different countries. Sì. Poi eh, un'altra, come no, istituzione importantissima credo che è stata quella di eh, proibire uh, o limitare eh, il licenziamento. Another point is the limitation of dismissals or ban on dismissals. Sì. Ma forse è stato questo, diciamo, su questa situazione dove si possono vedere le di le differenze più grosse. Uh, in this case probably we can um, see observe uh, bigger differences. Tra, tra i paesi. Eh, problemi che come ha, ha messo propriamente sul tavolo eh, diciamo Osruda dalla Turchia. For example we saw this sì. in the Turkish case. Abbiamo visto i problemi che ci sono adesso in tribunale proprio per decidere su queste situazioni che vengono nuove e che usano, diciamo, devono... So we can observe now how the tribunals uh, react to these uh, new situations, sì. new problems. Che hanno delle leggi, diciamo, tradizionali e queste nuove norme e devono mettere insieme... Because they have to reconcile the traditional norms and these new repeat norms and uh, sometimes it's not very easy. Mm -hmm. Poi eh, possiamo parlare di altre cose, però vorrei per esempio dire che mi, eh, mi pare molto un'esperienza molto particolare, molto, credo molto buona. We can of course discuss a lot of things, but I would like to mention an interesting experience. Sì, quella italiana, queste norme sulla salute. Italian experience, the norms on, on social security. Sì, eh, gli altri paesi non hanno parlato su di questo, però... Uh, other countries didn't mention this uh, point. Sì. Ma credo che tutti ovviamente hanno avuto anche intervenire su questo argomento, però questa esperienza... Uh, but everybody, uh, each country of course intervened also at this point and this is an uh, important experience in my view. Mm -hmm. Però veramente anche per me è stato qualcosa eh, interessante, molto buono, perché in questo modo di essere tutti coinvolti eh, si va meglio. Di, penso, It no? seems when uh, you have a lot of stakeholders involved, uh, this, is, this can be a very useful experience. Mm -hmm. E poi eh, non è venuto, però lui ci ha lasciato anche il suo paper, voglio dire quello della India. Ah, beh, beh, there is also an Indian paper? Sì, no, è, diciamo, eh, questo riguarda quello che dicevo nell'inizio, di come la base di ogni paese è diversa. So the author quindi... treated this point uh, which, uh, Carmen, which I mentioned in the beginning, uh, how uh, different is the starting point for each can single country. Perché per esempio eh, questo paper ci, eh, ci dice che nell'India eh, diciamo, ci sono dei gruppi, dei, de, delle persone con dei lavoratori particolari che con questa situazione, nonostante altre, le norme che possono essere... Because the Indian paper mentioned some particular groups of workers uh, which uh, notwithstanding these uh, norms sì, e che sono specialmente colpiti, che sono eh, quelli del lavoro minorile. Sono socially hit, uh, like um, minor, the, work, the work of minors. Mm -hmm. and e I lavoratori migranti. Immigrant immig workers. Sì, che hanno una situazione non tanto regolare. Which are uh, um, often in irregular position. Sì, e anche per esempio i lavoratori eh, che lavorano tramite agenzia. O, o temporary o agency questo... workers. E niente, sembra che, questo, che tutti i paesi hanno preso delle misure. So, uh, all the countries have taken some measures. Uh, durante la Covid, uh, during the pandemic, COVID, in the beginning. Poi, uh, molte di queste norme sono prorogate. And many measures uh, were then uh, prorogate, uh, prolongated, sì. prolonged. E poi, uh, ci sono dei paesi che hanno approfittato, diciamo, questa situazione per avere nuove norme. Uh, some countries uh, use this situation to produce new, create new norms. Now, uh, dopo la pandemia, voglio dire. And sì. after the pandemic, sì. Eh, vediamo, non lo so, perché sembra che la pandemia se ne è andata, ma non si sta, non so se è arrivando, sta arrivando un'altra. Uh, so now the pandemic seems to be uh, the end, but we, we don't know what, uh, what is expecting us in future. So. Eh, vabbè, io spero che abbiamo imparato qualcosa. So, e but it was, I hope it nuovamente. was a useful lesson for everybody. Possiamo agire tutto meglio. Sì? Grazie. Grazie Olma. Grazie a tutti. Grazie.
Super. Well, I think that that really has has been a tour de force covering uh, among these issues. If we stand if we stand away from the detail. Um, I think what's coming through is some serious questions about sources of law and regulation for labour law, because we're looking at a destruction of the typical paradigm uh, in the short term, and we don't know what sort of longer term effects they're going to be. I think we're seeing examples of differing regulatory techniques. Um, and of course, that gives rise to all sorts of consequences. Uh, for example, um, the sort of case law examples that we're seeing in Turkey starting to come through, and we'll see more of that across all countries as the courts start to decide whether what was done uh, was acceptable or not, and what the consequences for that were. We're seeing uh, an interaction which has already existed in some countries, but is much more sharp now between the regulation of labor law seen as a, as, as a self-standing component and health and safety and, and hygiene, uh, which has often been seen separately. And of course, uh, the latter taking criminal sanctions, whereas the former being primarily private civil law uh, conflicts. Um, and there, I think we're seeing some interesting consequences, especially with um, suspension of uh, criminal liability in the short term. And how do we replace that? The observation of telework and remote working being a good example, um, along with um, uh, the examples that Eleanor gave in, in Russia of groups who were not seen in the same light as the generality of regulatory protections being treated separately. And last but not least, which is where I'm going to ask Manfred to do a supplementary uh, observation, um, this question about the maintenance of employment as opposed to the maintenance of the employment relationship. And I think that's the big one where the price is going to determine the success. And we can see, I think, a number of examples of this. The longer term fiscal impact, of course, is not being made any, any more helpful by the economic impact of COVID and the economic impact of what is currently happening in the Ukraine. So we have a, a sort of triple whammy on that one. But can I invite Manfred to say a few words uh, specifically about that? But I know he wants to go wider than that. Manfred. Well, but before I do that, I would like to make uh, a general comment uh, on our discussion we just had. And, you know, I have done comparative work all my life, and I have learned one thing, and we have to be aware of this. It is absolutely useless and not sufficient to look on regulation to look on the normative patterns. What we have to do is to put things in context. And this shows us, and here I'm with Carmen, that things are different everywhere, even if they might look uh, similar on a normative uh, level. What do I mean by this? Just to give you an idea, you see, it makes a hell of a difference whether you have in a state a culture of the rule of law, whether you can rely on independent courts, whether there is easy access to, to courts, and so on and so on. What kind of actors are relevant to bring a case to the court, and so on and so on. And all this should be included. And if you would include that, then we would see how different things are in the different states, even if they look alike on the normative level. Having said this, now I uh, do what uh, Alan wants me to do. Well, you know, what he is referring to is something we in Germany have developed, not now, we have developed it already in the crisis of 2008. You remember? The, the world financial crisis. And there, of course, all countries were affected. And in many countries, well, people were laid off, you know, and, and were kicked out because there were nothing to, was nothing to do. In Germany, due to social dialogue, 
between trade unions and workers' representatives on the one side and employers on the other side. We made the following arrangement that under certain conditions, which I can't go into, the employers were entitled to reduce the working time. Of course, only with the consent of the workers' representatives uh, at the trade unions. Then, of course, the question arose, who is paying for the time where you have not to work? Because, you know, if you have a family and you work normally 40 hours a week or 35 hours a week, and now it's only 20 hours, well, it makes a hell of a difference. And then, of course, the arrangement by the social partners pushing the, the, the government was, well, the government mainly, but in addition, the social partners by collective agreement provide money, which is almost 100 percent, you know, for the period, uh, for the for the for the period you lose. This has worked wonderfully. What was the effect of this? Now I'm still with the financial crisis. The effect was the crisis was over. Everywhere, in all the countries, the people had to look again for skilled workers. We didn't. We had them on board. This was an enormous head start and has given uh, the Germans, you know, a booming period until COVID, you know. And in COVID, we have even ameliorated, uh, uh, improved this kind of system. And it's still working, by the way, you know, it's still going on. It's now, it started in, in the beginning of COVID in the early uh, 2020, and it's still going on. So uh, we are subsidizing highly, you know, the, 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 the companies and the employees. But as our uh, specialists for labor economy tell us, it's cheaper than paying employment uh, benefits, you know. So again, you know, we could start again and, and have started already. And we had an enormous, uh, 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 how do you say, increase of the, of the productivity uh, of, the, of the economy until the war. Now, uh, the problem, of course, is that nobody knows exactly what is the impact of the war. Uh, we have just got uh, yesterday new figures. The figures we got is <laughs> only 0 0.2% uh, uh, that's it. Uh, we have an increase, a, mi a minor, minor increase. We can say it, it's stable for the moment, you know. But the effect of course is a low unemployment rate and uh, uh, people who get their money, you know, who have their benefits, and uh, the companies survive. That's the strategy we have developed, not only now, but we have developed it, uh, uh, and uh, 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 we have improved it now in, 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 the, in the COVID period. And I just was at a conference uh, before coming here in Venice, and there uh, we heard from the European experts that this now is the pattern for the EU. You know, that's a pattern for the EU, which means they have copied the system. And uh, you see in the EU it works. Of course, you people from the Brexit, you don't understand this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Manfred. Two points, let me pick up. Um, the first one, the point about making comparisons entirely agree with Manfred's general proposition, but I think in this context we have a rather exceptional subject matter for comparing, and that is a commonly suffered impact. 
So COVID, for example, is something where functionally you can see the same challenges. But what's interesting is listening to the different, even with the small group of examples that we've heard about this afternoon, how it immediately reflects traditions of regulatory lawmaking, the point that Manfred's made about the rule of law and you have to be a little bit careful about that because the benefit of talking in terms of the rule of law and human rights is that um, in hindsight, academics can be very critical of pol politicians. Politicians in a situation like Italy uh, at the beginning of 2020 didn't know what the hell to do and nor did anybody else. And I think that that's very easily and quickly forgotten. Um, so it's very easy to raise- but Just let me tell you that if you look at digitalization, if we look at climate change, decarbonization, these are all also, you know, effects which are equal for all yeah, uh, yeah. economies. So it's not yeah. something special. Well, it is something special because there wasn't an answer. Nobody knew what was happening. Nobody knew what the scope do of the you know impact would be. We know what to do about climate change. We know what to do about it because we have Brexit. So we have all the answers. Things are wonderful. We have good weather in the UK. We have good food. We beat the German football team on penalties. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, and what's more, and it, yeah, West Ham, West Ham. Um, but but the, the other beauty, of course, is that we copied, we, we've taken a leaf out of the Japanese book of rules. We've copied what the Germans did with their maintenance of employment provisions, we actually went in at a higher level with the uh, payments out of the state, which is what's raising a number of issues now about where do you go if you have a population who want low taxes but still want to have the subventions, I mean, you, you, difficult one to square. But you currently have unemployment in the UK, 3.8%. There are more vacancies in the labour market last month than there are people looking for jobs. and. The usual answer to that is, well, of course, they're all Mickey Mouse, low paid jobs. They're not. There's a scream for skilled workers. And again, like the German experience, we've maintained and retained those skilled workers. But of course, because we were well ahead of the EU in developing the vaccines, we didn't have the drag of the 27. Um, we've managed to onshore most of our pharmaceutical research and development, which of course is a huge shift uh, away from traditional policies of the UK, which I think everybody was entitled to criticize in the past. So it's very interesting. And I'm not saying one approach is right and not because we don't know, time will tell, and we're all suffering in different ways. But it's very That's interesting exactly to see, I mean. it's very interesting to see how issues that should have been dealt with over the last 30 years of development of labor market regulation are now suddenly one being addressed, two answered, and three, we're learning new and creative ways of dealing with them. And I think when it comes to other areas like climate change and these ancillary areas as they've been regarded, but increasingly core integrated areas that we as labor lawyers have to look at, we will find that the creative juices are running much better than they were in that sort of traditional mold. And it's, I mean, it's easy to argue Brexit, EU, Europe. That's not what it's about. It's, it's about the effective That's learning. Joke, it's, you know. it's about the effective learning from each other. Some bad examples, some very good examples, some horrible examples, and some examples that are starting to show that they can survive over time. And that's where I think we all have to be looking to see the future of labor law in the post COVID era. So let me thank all of our speakers. I hope that um, uh, uh, we still have the line to, 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 uh, to Turkey. Um, it's marvelous to see blended uh, activity here as the, I understand it's called now. Um, Manfred and I hate the Zoom calls. I do. Um, we, we now refuse to teach by Zoom because it's such an awful thing. We prefer to go and eat and drink and spend time with friends That's rather great. than look at each other on television screens. And so it's delightful to see all of you here. Let me add my thanks to the organizers and the foundation for organizing all of this, for bringing us all here again. Tomorrow, we will have a more personal recollection of Marco. But I think if Marco had been here today, he would be both challenging and smiling at the discussions we're having because we're no closer 
to thinking the same than we ever were 40 years ago when we first started working with him. So thank you very much, all of the speakers, very grateful, all of the work you've put in, and we look forward to seeing the results of that, perhaps along the lines that Carmen has tremendously brought together for us, and certainly drawing on experiences much wider than the national examples we've heard today. So thank you all very much. End of the day. Thank you.